I'm Olive Dickinson. I'm a retired professor from the University of Alberta, and uh, I was a history professor. And my, uh, my latest book, which is the uh, Canada's First Nations, was first published in 1992, and it's out in the third edition this year. When I first started to work in, in Aboriginal history, the reaction of the professors was, well, what on earth do you want to work in that area for? Because you, there's, no, there's no historical evidence. The Indians were an oral people, an oral society, and without written documentation, you can't have history. <laughs> that, that was the attitude. So, so, that, <laughs> so the, the question arises, what is history? And uh, the, uh, the answer, of course, is that history is how we view ourselves, how we view ourselves in relation to ourselves, our own persons, in relation to our communities, in relation to our country, in relation to the cosmos. Meet Olive Dickison, renowned journalist, Aboriginal historian, single parent, grandparent, and author. As a middle-class girl growing up poor during the Depression, she had no idea she would come to change the face of Canadian history. But she did. Her books, huge and encyclopedic in their scope, are Canadian bestsellers, and they're changing the way Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people view their history and their country. When I think of Olive Dickinson, I'm thinking of a, a person such uh, who, who is a leader, an academic, a historian, a person of unique value, uh, bringing together a, uh, the, the non-Aboriginal world with the Aboriginal world and making, a, uh, making the next generation a little bit more fundamentally aware of our true history, of the, of the contribution of Aboriginal people. Non-Native people tell their history from their perspective. They have not been in uh, our boots to tell our particular side. That's one of the wonders of uh, the magic and the importance and the significance of all of Dickinson's work is that she's telling it from our perspective. And that's how she was able to write uh, a PhD about Canada's First People. This had never been done in the country before, as I say, because it, First Nations were beyond history, they were prehistorical, and she has brought them into the mainstream of Canadian history. She wanted to immortalize our history, who we are, where we came from, where we might be going. That, to me, was her real intent. But inadvertently, she is more immortalized. Born Olive Williamson in Winnipeg, Manitoba in 1920, she was the eldest daughter of a British-born accountant, Frank Leonard Williamson, and Phoebe Philomena Cote, descendant of Francois Cote, who came to Canada from France in 1634 to settle in the West with his Aboriginal bride. Olive would spend much of her life only vaguely aware of her Métis heritage. But when her well-to-do parents went broke in the 30s, the family wound up trying their hand at mink farming in northern Manitoba. To beat starvation, Olive's Métis mother taught Olive and her sister how to live off the land through the ancient ways of fishing, hunting, and gathering. But for Olive, the need for food was only one form of hunger. She yearned to know things, all kinds of things, and she soon found a way to begin her academic education. Molly and her sister went from a life of, of relative luxury and, and convent education and music lessons to up north where the nearest neighbor was miles away and they had only themselves. And as they got a little older, they walked the trap line. 
And uh, at the end of the trap line, there was a man lived alone, a bachelor, and he had a lot of books. And he was very kind. He would let them go into his house and warm up and borrow some books, and then they'd bring them back on the next trip. Luck is the best thing you can have in life. Better than brains, better than anything. <laughs> have luck. Because up in the woods, uh, living in the, in the woods, there had been a remittance man, Bob Hamilton, who had once been a government official in Scotland and had brought with him a, an extensive classical library and uh, subscribed to you know, the London Times, the London Observer. And so he would spend hours with us and that I was reading Marx and Plato. He was a classical scholar. So though I only had grade 10 education, I could discuss the, the, the Greek philosophers, the, you know, the, 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 what Marx thought on certain subjects, and uh, I just was extremely well informed and, uh, due to uh, the Scottish refugees' influence. World War II broke out in Europe. Olive, then 19, went south and found a job going door to door selling magazine subscriptions. But her talent for turning difficult situations into opportunities would bring her to another life-changing meeting, this time with a priest in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, a man known for helping poor kids get a university education. In southern Saskatchewan there I began hearing about this incredible priest, Athel Murray, who was, he was a, a, the most spiritual man I have ever known, ever encountered, a remarkable person. But he was a maverick. And in those days, southern Saskatchewan, where the boondocks, between the depression and the drought, it was in a very bad way. The kids just couldn't go to school because they had nothing to wear. And so Pierre took a, one look at this situation and harumphed away and said, something has to be done about it. By the time that Olive appeared, Father Athel Murray, or Pear as he became known, was a local hero who had pulled together a boxcar college where local boys could reside and study in converted railway cars. As more money became available, so did buildings. He was soon able to open his school to girls as well. He was both charmed by and protective of his young protege, Olive Williamson. We said, you know, she walks like an Indian. Meaning, because she wore moccasins quite a bit when she first came. That was another strange thing about her, you see. And uh, Pear called us over. Some of the boys had said we were not being very nice to this new girl. So he called us in and talked to us about that. And he said, supposing she were the Christ. Uh, we got home, we kind of looked at her. She had long black hair, and she had the high cheekbones, and she had the sort of ascetic look, you know, and skinny as a rail, as we all were at that point. And we thought, you know, she does sort of look like the pictures of the Christ. Well, so I think we warmed to her quite a bit more than just in case. <laughs> The smallest thing I can say about him is that he gave me my life. He gave me my life. Because uh, I, I, I just wouldn't have stood a chance otherwise. You made it. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge a very special Notre Dame alumnus. Pear saw in her the beginnings of greatness. Her tremendous work in the writing of the history of Canada's First Nations has been a major academic achievement. As she has been honoured, so has Notre Dame been honoured. Ladies and gentlemen, Olive Dickerson. She made it by herself. She's smart. Smart. She looked at everything. She could recognize art. You know, the rest of us who theoretically had more education in those fields would just look at her blankly because she could say, Oh, that's a Monet. No, I think that's a Manet. No, it's a Monet. Monet, you know? And she could tell us why. And, and even more esoteric artists than that, she would recognize from afar that's a so-and-so and so-and-so. Notre Dame College, through its affiliation with the University of Ottawa, 
granted Olive her first degree in 1943. Then followed a marriage, three children, a divorce, and a career in journalism at the Regina Leader Post, the Winnipeg Free Press, the Montreal Gazette, and the Globe and Mail. And always there was great financial struggle. But after all this, Olive once again needed to reinvent herself. Without so much as a glance at the fact that she was now in her late 40s, and at a time when most people would hold on to their security, Olive decided to cash in her meager pension fund at the Globe and Mail, pay off her debts, and start over. With Father Murray's blessing and backing, she moved to Ottawa, where she began attending night classes at the University of Ottawa, while working during the days as Public Relations Director for the National Gallery of Canada. Well, I first met Olive Dickerson as a student uh, at the National Gallery of Canada. I, I can remember being very impressed with this lady, uh, very professional. She spoke with authority. She knew her business. She had a sensitivity towards, number one, towards the art, but towards other things as well. Uh, it was much later that I was to discover that she did indeed have Native heritage. Olive herself only discovered her Aboriginal roots as a young adult when she went out west to visit her mother's side of the family for the first time. From then on, as a journalist and as an editor, she explored Aboriginal issues wherever she could. But none of it would prepare her for how the subject of Aboriginal history was viewed in the academic world. I uh, went back into the university and I was absolutely shocked when I got into the classroom and heard these professors talking about the savages who, who were, and, uh, and all the good things that the Europeans brought them and uh, you know, they, that, that these people were locked in time, they hadn't progressed, and, and on and on. So uh, I realized then I would just simply have to uh, put my efforts where my, my, my mouth was and, <laughs> and get it into it. The first point to realize when you're assessing the Indians' position in Canada and the kind of civilizations that they had it would be to realize that the Indians had developed skills that were particularly adapted to the circumstances of the country. They were perfectly at home in the northern forests and knew how to get around. They didn't get lost. The canoe. They were our Mack trucks, our Ferraris, you know, our Jedi Knight vessels. This simple, elegant, sophisticated vessel the canoe is the vessel whereby our culture is carried from one community to the next. The canoe, the birch bark canoe, the, the kayak, um, snowshoes, toboggans, I mean, the, the list is extraordinary. Agriculturally, uh, um, the Aboriginal societies had developed things like potatoes and tomatoes, corn, beans and squash, tobacco. They uh, had a whole range of leisure time activities. They had arts, whether it was porcupine quill work, embroidery on a deer skin, wood carving, or just in costume in general. The Wendat had metal. We find gold, silver, and copper here in North America in almost pure form. To understand the metallurgical technology, you really need to understand you're not using just a piece of copper as a utilitarian object, you're using a piece of copper as developed and crafted into a very beautiful animal or bird or some form of importance to the wearer. They didn't differentiate between the spiritual world and the physical world. They're two different aspects of the same reality and the importance of knowing that there are forces and counterforces. When you talk about Native religion, it's just a respect for all nature, the rivers, 
the trees, the air that we breathe, the sun that's shining today. We can still hold the buffalo sacred to us and he'll always be sacred to us. We wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for our ancestors surviving off of the buffalo. The stories that carried on through the many generations still exist within our people today. In our tradition, there's this idea of the creation of North America. It's a story of this woman falling from the heavens and falling on the back of the turtle. And uh, the water bird slowly brought her down gently onto the back of the turtle. And the water animals came up and brought pieces of earth from the ground and laid it on the turtle's back. And that is, that is North America. It's, it's a fascinating tale, and it's one that, uh, that, that's been retold and retold. The most of their tales are describing how men became human, became fully men, through the intercession of the gods. You need to have some kind of a guiding spirit from the other side who takes the form of a crow or a coyote or whatever, and he comes along and he teaches you the lesson. Regular initiation rituals, and uh, it, was, it was through the initiation rites where they would determine their lot in life. That's how a lot of our people became very wise and very knowledgeable about our way of life was because they lived in harmony with nature. Before a hunt took place, uh, we had to give thanks to the Creator for allowing us to take this animal to make our people survive. After the hunt was over, our people also gave thanks because this animal actually gave up its life to keep us alive. There were certain rules that had to be followed. If you were going to have a, uh, a harmonious development as a people and in a community, Otherwise, you'd end up in some kind of a disastrous situation. We had a matrilineal society in traditional times. Women are the teachers, women are administrators of the village. Men's role was beyond the palisade, beyond the, the village site. Their job was to cut wood, to do warfare, to hunt and fish, diplomatic relations. The longhouse was very, very important in the winter in bringing people together. It gave opportunities for families to teach younger uh, members of the family uh, about different uh, aspects of the culture. So rather than having to go out and work eight or 10 hours a day, this was uh, probably eight or 10 hours of educational opportunity, which is why in an oral tradition, an oral society, uh, this time was probably so important. In the, the oral tradition, the word is of primordial importance and the necessity of keeping your word. And you have a, a, a core of elders who are well, presiding over the, the recitals just to make sure that it is repeated exactly on from generation to generation. Huron society had three levels of representative democracy. Uh, this village would have been administered by a council, 
and in turn individuals from that council would have been appointed to the Council of the Nation and then the Nation Council would have appointed individuals to the Confederacy Council. In looking at how people achieve political consensus, uh, the Huron had great orators who would argue at length about specific topics. The political relationships establish group rights and responsibilities and individual rights and responsibilities. They had to meet challenges. In solving those challenges, their cultures developed. If there is an Indian tradition that is the most Indian of all traditions, it is the necessity to adapt to the circumstances in which you are creating your communities. Olive had had her moment of personal truth. Her studies from now on would be much more than a return to the glories of her youth when pure knowledge was her absolute delight. She was now determined to make the recovery of Aboriginal history her life's work. My first effort then was to demonstrate that uh, the Europeans didn't come along and just spread good tidings uh, to a passive receptive people who had no particular social forms, but to show that it was a genuine contact between two different societies, two different ways of looking at the world, and that the Indians, they had as rational a position from their point of view as what the Europeans had from theirs. But that was actually the start of the whole thing. And uh, as I say, to try, trying to honor all my ancestors. <laughs> Olive Dickison, Métis woman, newspaper reporter, student of history, the arts, and philosophy. Everything had combined to bring her to the task of uncovering the big picture of human settlement in Canada. A story of the country's first peoples that began at least 10,000 years ago. This would be perhaps the biggest Canadian history research project ever undertaken. And it wasn't going to be easy. In the historical profession uh, until the 1960s, you studied history from writings, uh, diaries, newspapers, written materials which had been left from a past era. But First Nations people didn't leave written diaries and notes, so how could they be a people that you would study in a professional historical way? All of, of course, uh, disagreed with that approach, and uh, because if, to her, uh, First Nations people were not prehistorical people, but they were living and breathing people, and she was an example. She was a professional writer. She was somebody who came to the university from having been um, a newspaper woman, of having written a lot of uh, a lot of very interesting stories and who knew how to express herself and who knew how to articulate things. Now that was one benefit from those many years in, in journalism, where you learn to observe, to read, to pick up things from what you're reading, to read fast, and, uh, and, and try and present as equitable a picture as possible out of what you get. You're, you're not, you're not uh, arguing the, what the one side or the other. In the end, you try and let the facts speak for themselves. In 1972, she completed her master's degree with her thesis, Louisburg and the Indians, a study in imperial race relations, 1713 to 1760. It was a, in thèse magistrale, as we'd say in French, it was really a, a masterpiece uh, as a thesis for what it brought to our understanding of what was going on at Louisbourg. And, especially the, the connection with the native people. It's the scope of her learning that is tremendously admirable and uh, unusual among Canadian scholars. And that is something I admire very much. You can count on her. You can count that if she's written something, she's researched it thoroughly, that she knows what she's talking about, and uh, that you can trust her judgment because it's based on a tremendous amount of research and of learning. As Olive grew to understand the scope of her task, she began to see how to go about it. 
While working on her MA, she also produced a book, Indian Arts in Canada, with her former protege, Tom Hill. From then on, art would be a resource she would call on as she wove together an interdisciplinary approach to the study of history. She realized that you couldn't take a narrow historical approach. You had to, uh, to write First Nations history. You had to be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. She uh, began to uh, look into art. Physical remains, costumes of First Nations people, the art that First Nations people had left. She began to look into anthropology and bring that into the, the study of history. So she began to take this multidisciplinary approach as, as well as the documentation which she found, uh, government documents, uh, for example, Indian agents who had been on reserves, their memoirs or uh, letters in the archives. Olive next moved on to the doctoral stage, the highest level of academic qualification. But Native history had never been the subject of a Canadian doctoral dissertation. There was no specialist in Canada who could direct and adjudicate such a thesis. But that didn't stop Olive Dickinson. She cleared a path through it all, gathering native oral histories and combining them with the original texts of the colonizers in the archives of England, Spain, and France. These accounts were abundant in their descriptions of Aboriginal societies, the early contact relationships, and the original jurisprudence which laid down the legal framework of how Aboriginal people would be overtaken and governed. No previous historian had sought out these documents. But the reporter, Olive, did, learning to read French and Spanish in the process. She published breakthrough histories that have become Canadian Studies textbooks. There was a lot more material available than was generally believed. Now you can argue that this was through European eyes, and most of it is, but a lot of it was very sympathetic to the Indians, and with the help of anthropology and the other sciences, you can make some very well-informed guesses as to what the situation actually was. the 1670s, when the French wanted to proclaim the sovereignty of the King of France over these territories, Jesuit interpreters did the translating and the interpreting. And they had a great big powwow with many native tribes, and they all sang and swore along with the King, and French flags were unfurled and crosses were planted and everything. The French were convinced that according to the law of nations and according to international law and so forth, they had just been establishing their sovereignty and the native people had accepted it. The native people understood that they were getting a very powerful ally who was going to defend them. The idea of absolute ownership, individual ownership, was just totally absent in, in any of the Indian societies. That was a strictly a European concept. The explorers were trying to find passage through the mountains to the Pacific Ocean, and the pagans found them. They were starving. They were freezing. So the pagans brought them in and helped them survive that winter, showed them how to live off the land, how, what kind of animals to eat, what kind of plants for medicine, uh, kept them warm, helped them on uh, clothing and how to build shelter. 
the importance of maps. The Indians drew their maps in terms of days travel and, and how long it took to get to a place. And, uh, and at the time of the year, you can expect the ice to form. And it was on the basis of those maps that the Europeans finally penetrated the country and reached the Pacific Ocean. Essentially, it's a, it's a cooperative relationship because the, the aboriginals are now able to procure items that are going to make their lives a little less time consuming. The natives' knowledge of the land, the, the, the canoe routes and where to go, and, uh, and also the, their abilities as, as guides and interpreters, all of those help to, to create a, a mutually beneficial relationship. The native qualities of hospitality and generosity were uh, values that were prized. The native medicines, uh, the herbs, the ointments, and so forth, came to be appreciated by the French doctors. They wrote back to France about these medications that they were learning about. The Indians had well-functioning societies, that their societies functioned. The fact that the societies functioned is proven by the fact that the Indians were there when the Europeans arrived. All of Dickinson decided that she was going to put First Nations people front and center as an integral part of the history of Canada. So she began to put this together and she presented this case to the authorities at the University of Ottawa, who finally, with the help of her supervisor, Cornelius Janin, made certain that she was able to do a PhD looking at First Nations people in Canada. But it was a, a battle and uh, she could have easily uh, given up, but when Olive was determined to do something, she didn't make a big fuss about it. She just did a lot of research, brought the facts together, and then presented uh, her findings, and uh, they couldn't say no to her. Her doctoral thesis became her first best-selling textbook, The Myth of the Savage, published in 1984. The first occupants of the land are the natural owners of that land. It's very clearly, unequivocally included in, in Justinian's Code, which was compiled in the 6th century and was the functioning international principles of, of Europe. It was a principle in Roman law. In fact, the Romans thought it was so obvious that they didn't, it was, well, if you could prove that you were a first owner, that ended the argument if you were a first, a first inhabitant of a land. So how did they get around it? How did the Europeans get around that? Human, human in form only. You see that expression in, in some of the earlier writings, that they were human in form only, and therefore didn't have the same rights as real humans, which the Europeans were. <laughs> so the, the first official modification you get was that um, in 1537, the Pope issued a bull, a sublimus deus, in which he said that the Indians were human beings and they had full right to their freedom and to their property as any other human being. And, uh, but in spite of that proclamation, general politics of the day didn't accord the Indians the, the full rights, considered them to be subhuman. And very quickly, the, uh, the Indians got classed as uh, savages. This set a pattern, and once you get a pattern established, it's God's own job to get it changed. And so the idea of Indians, say, for instance, being savages and uncivilized pervaded right until the present day. The Indians have always had a clear idea of who they are and what their history was. But as there was no question, they had no voice. The story here for me begins with the Kingston and Gananoque Mississauga Ojibwe. They were nomadic hunters and gatherers. They were being marginalized into the unsettled areas of Upper Canada. 
At Grape Island, there were two schools for carpentry and home economics. They were silenced from their language, and in, in losing their language, they lost their culture and their, their traditions. So um, they, they only spoke Ojibwe in their minds or in, in, in closed quarters where they couldn't be, be caught because it was punishable. We were placed on reservations. We couldn't leave the reserve until we signed a, a, a paper permitting us to leave the reserve. And we had to sign on that paper how many days we're going and how, when will we be back. And also who our relatives are on that paper because if we don't come back, our relatives are rounded up and put in jail until we do come back. They took all the kids and put them in residential schools. And those kids, they weren't to talk their language. They weren't to believe in equality that Creator gave us that we were created equal with land, plants, and animals. But instead, that God gave dominion of land, plants, and animals to human beings. It was part of Sir Johnny MacDonald's national dream to populate Canada. The Métis wanted to be a part of that. Louis Riel had a strong faith in the government. He believed that they would believe he was taking up this uh, opposition because of what he wanted for his people. In actuality, Louis Riel was taken to Regina and he was executed on November 16th, 1885. Um, it is speculated that for Johnny McDonnell, it was um, easier to have one man sacrifice than to admit that the voice of the people in the Northwest Territories had gone unanswered. At the end of the 19th century, it was just assumed that in about 50 years, there'd be no more Indians left. They'd, they'd all be gone. In 1992, Olive published her ultimate work, Canada's First Nations, a landmark both in Canadian history and in worldwide contact history for the first time providing a complete historical overview of Canadian Aboriginal societies, the story of what had been evolving for centuries and how it all changed when the Europeans came into their midst. It is a book about history that has changed history, both the perceptions of what happened in the past and what would have to happen in the future. Dr. Dickinson's work is one of the few defensible documentations of our true history in this country. So it's great for the politicians to get up and talk about it all they want, but without the academic rigor and, uh, and the contribution that Dr. Dickinson has made, uh, we, we wouldn't have as much of a leg to stand on that we do now. And I have to believe that in some way, uh, Dr. Dickinson's work has translated through the decisions of the Delgamuth case and, and the Nishka case, the Supreme Court cases, and our fundamental rights uh, and recognitions by uh, non-Aboriginal people that in fact, yes, we did live here, as sovereign nations and we lived here with rich cultures and histories and we survived against the rigors of the harsh environment. Somewhere, somehow the Creator has been guiding us and protecting us and, and we have to remember that. And, and every loss is, is a message. It's a deep message for all of us. We have gone through a valley of darkness. We've come out of it. And so all these things were great tests of First Nations. But our heritage has always been passed on to this day. So when we look at 
the value of where we are. It gives us so much to want to live. I'm a fancy child dancer. I'm 24. So I have my degree in psychology and Native American studies. I think there is a renewed interest. We've got a lot of people coming in. The powwows are getting bigger and bigger every year. Powwows are important to Native people in that it's an opportunity for us to come together and sort of reconnect. We've got people from all over the U.S. and Canada that are coming into one place. It's a sort of an opportunity to talk to another person from a different community and sort of get a take on what's happening in contemporary culture. And then we've also got an opportunity to find out a little bit more about everyone else's traditions. Everybody sings their own song. Everybody prays in their way. Everybody has their own language. And indigenous people, I think, are the uh, epitome of understanding that diversity because of the way each of the indigenous uh, societies across Canada live within their geographic areas. This is the biggest fish. They are diverse. And I think if Canadian society can accept within its political, economic, and uh, educational aspirations the diverse nature of its own society, then I think we would come uh, to be a truly Canadian society, helping each other, sharing and giving from the heart. When First Nations people were asked to surrender their land, it wasn't their land, it was an impossibility. It was not given them to do that. So they begin to ask important questions of how can we share living on this land? Well, we're here at Alderville's Black Oak Savanna, which is a fairly rare environment in Canada. It's here due to the cooperation of the people of Alderville First Nation who protect it. What is our relationship with this earth? That is the one dialogue, the one question that I do know that First Nations people are interested in and they are very interested in providing some of the solutions to answer that question. First Nations role in the United Nations environmental program is a stated fact. We are now able to work with our federal agencies to cooperatively manage and preserve these types of environments. We have a unique concept of land ownership which can be brought to bear and it has everything to do with uh, the concept of sharing an equivalency, if you will. If you read all of Native peoples in Canada, you'll find it's, it's, it's factual, it's, ob uh, it's objective, and, and it's, and it's non-blaming, non so that, so that there's, there's no, in quotation marks, guilt trips laid on, laid on the, the non-Aboriginal population. We have a lot of non-Aboriginal people who are interested in Native studies simply because we're approaching it from this particular perspective. All of sees Canada not simply as a country which was formed from the French European legacy and the British European legacy, but she sees Canada as beginning with uh, First Nations people. She wants First Nations to have a proper role in the country as the founding civilization composed of these various First Nations. I'm a great believer in the overall, huh? trying to fit things into the overall. Scholarship very often concentrates on specific areas. It's much easier, much tidier, and you can get a complete picture of a specific area. But in the meantime, you, you miss the context. 
I am a great believer in trying to incorporate everything into the large picture, as large a picture as you possibly can. And so that's what I did in, in Canada's First Nations, and they brought in the whole history of Canada. I am pleased to announce the recipient of the National Aboriginal Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Olive Patricia Dickinson, Professor Emeritus of the University of Alberta and Adjunct Professor of the University of Ottawa. In the presence of your friends and family, colleagues, and in the presence of all your ancestors, congratulations, and we eagerly look forward to your next book. That's an honor song for Olive Dickinson. <laughs>